purpose and plan you have for us. And Lord, I thank you for those, uh, Lord, that are faithful and paying their tithes and giving offerings. And Lord, uh, supporting the work of this ministry. And Lord, all, not only what we're doing now, but what we intend to do in the future. We just want to give you thanks. Lord, I pray that you'll bless the gift and the giver. Lord, use uh, what we do in this place for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, super, super, super. Little ones, if you will slip out, little ones. You guys roll out of here for Children's Church. That would be awesome. All right. So last week was a preparation for us, that aspect of sanctification, right? Instructions of sanctification. So what have we been doing? We're just a quick review. Uh, we're coming out of the defeat of Ai, right? Right now the Israelites have suffered and are now in a point of they're in really dealing with confusion and frustration. What we've been doing over the last month is really delving into the cause and effect of hidden sin, how that has impacted them. Now, we know the hidden sin that they're dealing with is a man named Achan, a man named Achan who decided to take up the accursed thing that God told him not to take up, and it's in his hidden sin that has now set them on this path that has led them to a defeat. And what we saw last week was the fact that as Joshua was revealed, these, these truths were revealed to him, that he was humbled in the moment. Joshua was really woken up to the fact that, you know what, the issue wasn't with God. The issue was, was with them. And initially, he was a little hard-headed, but he started, he started to listen. And he recognized the fact that in that message, instructions to sanctification, what we saw was the fact that God, first of all, rewarded his humility. Joshua was humbled through what he heard. He had a new perspective on things. And what God did was use one little word to encourage him. Up. He said up. And that one little word up, what he was telling was, hey, you know what? I need you to get your focus off of the defeat where you've had your mind and your heart for so long. Now shift yourself over to the future success that's ahead. So as he's being encouraged in this moment, understand Joshua's being restored, but now his responsibility is going to be to restore the people, right? They all need to be on the, on the same page. And what he did was the first thing God told him to do was he said, sanctify them. This was a matter of revealing the hidden sin that was within them. They needed to recognize the fact that there was an issue with them. Again, they did not know. And sanctification is to be set apart for the use of God, seeking holiness. That's what they needed to do. And what we saw in the fact that is God was doing this. Now, recognize, sanctification was not just for them. It's also for us, right? Sanctification, we need to be setting ourselves apart for the work of God. And in order to do that, we must look within ourselves. That's what he was telling them to do. Sanctify yourselves. Look within yourselves to find the accursed thing, the thing that is wrong in your life. And there's a hidden sin in many people's lives, things that we're not willing to face, not willing to, to recognize. But what he was doing, and in fact, he said, look, you know what? The, the idea in recognizing was to say, you know what? I want to set you free from the impact of this hidden sin. You've dealt with this defeat. You've dealt with this adversity because of it. And what he was doing is revealing to them their vulnerability. Why did they become vulnerable because of that sin? And what he showed us last week is the fact that when they were walking in obedience with God, their enemies could not stand before them. But when they were in disobedience, they could not stand before their enemies. And that principle that it showed us is, look, hey, our sin and disobedience empower our enemy. They strengthen the devil in bringing destruction into our lives. So we're in a situation where we get to be, you know, in our own lives. We can be the ambassadors of our own spiritual victories by surrendering and submitting to God. Or we can be the gateway to our own destruction and our own spiritual defeat if we surrender and submit to sin. See, there's a choice for us every day. Sanctification is a, is a choice. And it's with that sobering perspective that we looked at the idea of them having to deal with the sin. He said, look, you need to address it. You need to deal with it. And what happens, we looked at the fact that, yes, it's our responsibility to address our sin. It's our idea. It's our responsibility to find it. But ultimately, we can't destroy our sin. That command was given to Joshua very specifically because guess what? Joshua was a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus has the power to destroy sin. You and I cannot. So what do we do? We take it to the authority who can destroy it, Joshua's responsibility. Understand, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a prophetic picture of Christ on the cross when we hear this because we can bring our sin to the Lord and he can destroy it. The penalty that comes along with sin, the damnation, that the power that it has over us, we're set free <laughs> through the power of the cross. So what we find is ultimately spiritual victory, right? Spiritual victory is achieved only through the power of God and our submission to it. This is essential. So as we look at that, and this morning what we're going to do, is we're going to be reminding ourselves, Joshua's going to be telling us, talking about the accountability they have to God. 
He's going to be speaking to us as well. The process of rooting out sin. How do they address it? How do they deal with it? The sin has caused them so much heartache, so much pain. And what we're going to see here is the fact that God is going to narrow the sphere of people all the way down in responsibility until he gets down to the individual. He will reveal the sin. He's going to do it through four different things we're going to look at today. First, we're going to have a, a come to Joshua moment. I know it's called traditionally a come to Jesus moment, but Joshua is what we're working with. <laughs> Joshua is the Hebrew rendering of Jesus. So we're having a come to Joshua moment where God in that moment is going to refine their accountability. He's going to define sin's, sin's penalty, and then he's going to reinforce his policy. Now this morning, we're going to, I'm going to, this message is going to be different than any other message that we've taught. What I'm going to do today is we're going to break the message up into three different specific parts. We're going to address it from, first of all, a doctrinal standpoint. Doctrine means teaching, okay? Doctrine means teaching. This is the deep biblical meaning that God wants us to get from the scripture that we're going to read as we look at this passage. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the historical. The historical is how these events played out in history. Then the last one's going to be devotional, okay? So it's going to be almost like three different messages. Not three times as long, I promise. <laughs> but like three different messages. And the devotional is going to be how do we take what we learn and how do we apply it in our lives. So what we're going to basically do is have the exact same, we're going to go through the same four points, but from three different perspectives. And it'll help us to understand what God wants us to understand, what was going on in history, and now how do I take this knowledge that I have and how do I turn this into what I need in my life, okay? And we're going to do that in this message, which is titled Answering to God, okay? Answering to God. May we have ears to hear. Ears to hear, not just collectively, but individually. Remember, Wednesday nights are about application. I need us to hear this because this stuff is important. Very, very important. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for today, for my brothers and sisters. Thank you for each one that's here, uh, for their hearts, God, to hear truth. And, Lord, I do pray. Father, I know you've spoken to me, and I'm asking you just please speak through me. Uh, Lord, that the truth would be the one that you would give, God. I don't have anything to bring to this message but problems and confusion. So, Lord, I would ask you to remove me from the equation. Take the human element from this message, Lord, and I pray that, Father, you'd help me uh, to say, uh, thus saith the Lord, to give the truth of your word, uh, directing guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be in Joshua chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. It says, In the morning, therefore ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come by man, man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. Okay. Now, considering this passage from a doctrinal perspective, we know Joshua is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that. We also know that the picture, we are pictured in the Israelites. So we see in this, it's what he's telling us, in the morning there's going to be a great gathering where they're all going to be brought to stand before him. Okay? This come to Joshua moment. Verse 14, first part says, In the morning therefore ye shall be brought according to your tribes. Now biblically we know that there is a special day coming. There is a special day coming. Now how does a day come? It comes through a through a morning, right? A morning is where the day starts. So we know that there's a day coming. We call it the day of the Lord. That shows up in scripture 29 different times exactly that way. We'll also see it listed as a day, the day, God's day, the great day of the Lord. Isaiah 13, 9 says this, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Joel 1.15 says this, Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Again, if it doesn't show up as, those, as it does those specific spelling outs, it also shows up, and there's a, little, there's a little icon that God puts in Scripture that shows us the second coming of the Lord, and it's a term, that day. It'll say in that day or on that day. Very specifically, you'll see when it says on those days, it's talking about the tribulation. In that day, it's talking about the second coming of the Lord. And what we see is the fact that God, now this is a time frame. This is going to be from the time of the rapture all the way through the millennial reign. That's the day of the Lord, that time period. And what we find here is God's going to gather humanity unto himself. And we see the prophetic picture this morning of what's going to take place. Now, 
when we think about it from that perspective, knowing that there is a morning coming, a day of the Lord coming, last week there was something that God said in the message, which was this in Joshua 7, 13, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. There's a morning coming. You need to sanctify yourself today for tomorrow. And guess what? The Bible says, you know not what the morrow brings. Could be today. It could be tomorrow. There is coming a morning. Romans 14, verse 11 through 12 says this. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, there is something called an advent in Scripture, okay? The advent. The first advent is when the Lord came to earth physically, okay? That's his first time when he came. And he came as a servant. He came as a savior. He came as a sacrifice in his first advent. In his second advent, he's going to come as a conquering king. So when we see him here, and it talks about the fact that every knee is going to bow, that did not happen the first time he came. But the second time he comes, it's going to happen. So the second coming is talking about that second advent. And what we're going to see here is the fact that God is going to gather them on that day in order to refine their accountability. Notice this verse 14. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households. And the household which the Lord shall take shall come by man by man. And we see here that God is going to guide through this process. He's going to take every, every nation, every kindred, every tongue and gather them together until he gets down to the individual to the individual in order to reveal those that have defied his word, those that have lived in defiance of him and his word. And understand, it is important to understand at this point in time that there are going to be two judgments that we're going to mention today, okay? Two judgments. There'll be one for those that are born-again believers. If you are a child of God, if you receive Christ as your Savior, there is a judgment that you're going to stand at. That judgment is called the judgment seat of Christ. We see it in 2 Corinthians 5.10. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, so this is a judgment for service, not for sin. Okay? This is important to recognize. Our sin was judged already on the cross of Calvary. The law had a requirement of a penalty that had to be paid by way of sacrifice. And Christ, on the cross, paid that price. So we're not there because of our sin. That was on Christ. We're there for our service. How do we do in our service to him? But then there's another judgment. This is called the great white throne judgment. And this will be a judgment of the lost world for their sin. And this is what we see pictured in Achan. Listen to Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, everybody, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which, which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. What it's saying is no matter where you died on this earth, if you've been burned, if you've been buried, if you've been by the bottom of the ocean, wherever you are, every single person who's ever lived on this entire earth is going to be gathered up, and God's going to say, you're going to stand before me, every one of you, no matter what your life. And so understand, everyone will stand accountable to him. And what we see pictured in Achan in, this, in the book of Joshua is the fact that, guess what? There are some people that claim to believe believers. They just blend right in with everybody else. They march with everybody else. They carry their sword with everybody else. They go to battle just like everybody else. They sit in church. They carry a Bible. They know what to say. They know when to say amen and when not to say amen. But guess what? They say they're believers, but, but they're not. Last week, we looked at Judas, right? Who's right amongst the 12? A picture in the church. In fact, here's a deceiver. What we're going to find with Achan is, guess what? Achan has played the part. He looks just like everybody else, but soon enough it's going to be revealed that he's not like everybody else. He stands in defiance of God. So the people are being gathered together. We see the righteous and the unrighteous are gathered here, ultimately to pass judgment. Some for service, some for, for sin, as God will now define sin's penalty in verse 15. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath. God's judgment for sin is by fire. Okay? So as we continue in the description from the great white throne in Revelations 20, 
verses 14 and 15, where we finish up. It says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Listen, the book, the book of life contains the names of those who have received Christ as Savior. They have eternal life through him, through their trust and faith in Christ and Christ alone. But for those who have not, no matter how religious they may be, no matter how kind they may be, how moral they may be, they're going to face a judgment by fire. It's just what's going to happen. It's just the truth. Because listen, if you have not received Christ, if you haven't received the gift of God through salvation, which by the way, he offers to the entire world, no one is left out. He offers it to everyone. Romans 10, 13 says, for whosoever, anybody, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That word shall, you know what that word means? Guarantee. God's saying, I'm giving a guarantee. And this phrase right here, whosoever, anybody on this planet, if you'll call upon me by faith, you shall, I'll guarantee you will be saved. And you know what's very interesting as we look at this and we go, okay, okay, okay. If you recognize in the verses that we just read in verse 14 and 15, the word shall in two verses shows up nine different times. He's going, I guarantee you that there is a judgment that is coming. Nine times in two verses, shall, it shall, it shall, it shall. And guarantee, the same way he guarantees salvation, he is guaranteeing a judgment. And for those who have not received Christ, there's going to be a judgment by fire, just like there's going to be for Achan. And it's a frightening, terrible thing, but it's the truth. And the last point, what is he going to do? He reinforces his policy. Verse 15 finishes this way. Because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. This judgment is a result of disobedience and defiance of my law. This is of his own doing. And I want to read you another passage of scripture from the minor prophet Malachi, chapter number four. We're going to look at four verses. And I want you to hear, here's again, speaking of the second coming. Listen to Malachi four. For behold, the day cometh. How does the day come? In a morning. That shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Do you remember what it said in verse 15? It says it will burn, it, God said he'll burn them with fire, he and all that he hath. He says root and branch. He's saying everything's going to be burned. Exactly the same thing. There is coming a day, a morning, when judgment is going to come by fire upon sin. Verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness. Notice it's capital S-U-N. It is speaking of the Lord. The son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and ye shall go forth. Your end is not destruction. Your end is going forward and grow up as calves of the stall. You know why it's important to be a calf of the stall? Because if you're a calf of the wilderness, you're out there manging and granging and digging and trying to just to stay alive. But you're a calf of the stall. Guess what? Three squares, baby. Fresh water. You're cared for. You're brushed. Man, they're taking care of you. You're provided for. You're protected. You're a calf of the stall. Saying, God's saying, hey, you know what? That's what the son of righteousness is going to bring. There's going to be destruction upon those that are the sin of sin. But those are my children, man. You're going to be taken care of. And understand, it says they, 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 these people have defied God's command. This day of judgment is coming because of that fire. That's what's going to happen. Verse 3. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Again, pointing to that day, prophetically pointing to the second coming. And do you remember what Joshua was told to say in verse 15? And it shall be that he that is taken of the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, burned to ashes. And he said this, this is how verse 15 finished. Because he hath transgressed my covenant of the, the, covenant, that's the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. Listen, I gave my law, and one of you decided to defy it. So the result that he's going to face is of his own doing. And what God's going to show us in Malachi chapter number 4, verse number 4, I want you to notice where he circles back to, why is this fire coming? Verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded you unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Keep my law. Keep my law. 
live according to my law and experience spiritual life. Listen, guys, Jesus fulfilled the law, okay? The law had a requirement of a sin debt being paid. When Jesus came, he died on the cross to fulfill that very requirement. Matthew 5, 17, this is during the Beatitudes. Listen to what Jesus says. Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I come to be the payment that the, the law requires. Listen, and putting our faith in Jesus Christ and him alone, man, we are putting our faith and we are keeping the law. We're maintaining what the law requirement is. And those who deny Christ and the law, guess what? They're going to experience a spiritual death. There's an inescapable penalty for sin that shall be paid. Listen, either by our suffering Savior or our own sinful flesh. People need to know the truth because time grows short. God wants us to realize that there is coming a day. There is coming a day very near, very soon. And we need to have eyes to see and ears to hear. It should change the way we see the world. It should change, change the way we see our brothers and sisters. It should change the way we see people in the world that we deal with on a regular basis. It should break our hearts for what breaks his, as it said in the song. Next, let's look at the historical passage. Now, historical, this is nothing more than what's taking place. This is, we're looking at a historical record. So we're going to first look at the come to Joshua moment, okay? In this morning, it says, in the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes. Now, can you imagine, imagine Joshua, or now Achan, hearing this news. You're going to be brought before me. Now, he's also going to hear how everything's going to play out how it's going to be recognized, identified, down to the man, the punishment that's going to come. He hears all that stuff. And notice, he has an entire day, a day and an evening. Can you imagine me and Aiken laying in your bunk at night, thinking about the morning? Oh, boy, this should go great. Right? Can you imagine the pressure he must have felt? He knows what he's done. You know where all those treasures are? They're under his tent. He dug him under the tent and put him underneath his own family. He hid them there. And so here Achan is laying there thinking about this. And we can see this is the grace of God being extended to, Josh, to, to, to Achan. Consider this. He has a night to decide, a choice to make. What if Achan, what if Achan had said, you know what? God, you know what? I just got to come clean. I got to tell you what I did. I'm going to dig this stuff out. I'm going to bring it out and show it to Joshua and say, look, I'm going to beg you forgiveness. I'm going to fall on my knees and beg for mercy. Could he have made things right with God? We don't know. Because he didn't. He didn't. He chose to hide it. And Joshua's then going to inform them, guess what? I'm going to refine the accountability. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and, and the households which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. So there are 12 tribes represented in this gigantic mass of humanity, literally up to 2 million people. We would look out on that and just be like, unbelievable. there's not a stadium anywhere near that can hold that. It's more than people living in, this, in, in, in the city. All these people gathered together. And we think about that and we go, well, okay. So... There's the tribes. Then they're going to be delineated by their offspring. Okay, so there's a tribe that's named for a certain man, then his offspring, then his offspring, and so on and so forth, all the way until you get down to the individual person. And what's interesting is if we go back to Joshua 7, 1, we actually heard Joshua's, or actually, J I want to, man, I want to, Achan's lineage. I cannot get those two straight. Achan's lineage. Listen to Joshua 7, 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass and the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah took of the accursed thing and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now, Joshua does not know this, but consider the fact that Joshua trying to work through all 12 tribes, going from tribe to family to, to household to individual. That would be an unbelievable task and an impossibility. But what's so cool is we see that God is going to walk him through it. Next, he's going to define sin's penalty. Verse 15. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath. This begs the question, why didn't Achan humbly fall before the Lord when he heard that penalty? Because recognize, he knows it's not just for him, it's for his whole family. He hears what's going to happen, the punishment that's going to come. If not for himself, why not for them? Yeah. But what happens is he remains silent. He just puts his head down and chooses to remain silent. And this tells us 
It gives us a revelation of Achan's faith. It shows us what he thinks of God. It shows us what he thinks of Joshua. Listen, his concern is that, you know what? Nobody saw me. And if nobody saw me and I got it buried with nobody seeing me, I'm not worried. I'm going to be okay. I'm just going to keep it hidden and hope for the best. And you know there are people right now today living with hidden sin in this room even going, you know what? I'm just going to keep it hidden and hope for the best. This is a cautionary tale to us all. This secret sin is hidden under his tent. And amazingly, Joshua or Joshua's going to be uh, tell him all that's going to befall upon him. And Achan yet still will remain silent. He will literally defy God's omniscience and God's power and literally continually defy his words. Josh or Achan, man, Achan is living in defiance of God, denying his accountability. And now God's going to inform him about the punishment. He's going to reinforce his policy. Because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. God had warned them specifically about this very thing. Back in Joshua chapter 6, before they ever got to Jericho, and ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed, and ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Achan heard this news. He was told this before they ever got there. He knew it was wrong. Yet he chose his will over God's word. Let me say that again. He chose his will over God's word. And when we choose sin, that's what we're doing. We're choosing our will over God's word. And you see, he knew it was wrong. If he, did, if he, wasn't, if he didn't know it was wrong, obviously it wouldn't be buried underneath his tent, right? But if understand, Josh, it's not God's not doing this because he doesn't want them to prosper. That's not it at all. Because no, this is the only one. Jericho was the only one. He said, I need to set a precedence with you guys. When you go, what I need you to do is learn how to deny yourselves. You're going to see things you're going to really, really want. Don't do it. Don't touch it. Deny yourselves. And guess what? I'm going to provide for you like crazy. It's going to be amazing. If you just hold off, don't do it. But he just couldn't stop himself. Understand, God's desire here is for them to learn how to deny themselves and learn how to give to him. An important principle that so many people struggle with even today. And that's a fitting place to switch over to the devotional application. Okay, well, you'll find with the, with the doctrinal, now this is important, with the doctrinal application, it has to be established before we go to the devotional, okay? Very, very, very important point. If you do love a devotional concept or a devotional application and you don't understand a doctrinal truth, what will happen is you'll take the Bible and you'll fit it to what it is that you want it to say. If the doctrine is established, which gives us a foundation to work from, then we develop our devotional understanding. How do I apply what I've learned? Because I know the truth, and we build upon the truth. Very, very, very important. Very few people teach doctrine in this day and age. And because of that, there's a tremendous amount of false teaching that exists. So we establish the doctrine, then we establish the historical, and now we go to this devotional. How do we apply it in our lives? First, we get we have a come to Joshua moment, right? In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. Now, it will be on that day, right? Mankind is going to stand before a holy judge. A new dawn will be ushered in. A new age will be ushered in. God's children are being gathered together in preparation for a new heaven and a new earth. 2 Peter 2, 3, verses 12 and 13 says this, Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. But see, prior to that perfect creation, God will judge this fallen creation. Listen, the lost and the saved will be judged. The lost are the saved for their motives. We serve the Lord, but did we do it out of humility and it's trying to fulfill God's will, or do we do it out of pride, how we, were, how we were seen? 2 Corinthians 5, we already read verse number 10. I'm going to read it to you again real quick. It says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone, uh, everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, the next verse is very important. Listen to what it says here. Verse 11, knowing therefore, 
Okay, so we understand this is all about the judgment seat. This is for believers, right? This is where we are. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. Be knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, the terror of the Lord, as a believer standing before God, as he peels back the, the, our life, and he says, this is your life. I called you to be this. And this is how you did. Roll them, Johnny. And we look at the instances where God put someone in their life where he said, this is one I need you to reach. You have no idea what's going on in their life. Reach them. I'm going to compel you. My spirit is going to draw you to speak. I don't want them to think bad of me. I'm not sure how this would go. You know what? Next time. And we'll look at all the times we denied him, all the times that we failed him, all the times that we dropped the ball when God said, look, I have you on this earth for me. You're supposed to be an image of me. You're supposed to show them me, not you. And we were concerned about how we looked, how we were dressed, our car, our house, our possessions, our, our title, our name, our lineage, what we were going to leave behind for us. And that's not why we're here. Those things will be revealed to us. God's going to show us what a waste so much of the time that we were given was where we pursued God in prideful mindset, where we literally took God and we understood who it was we wanted him to be, and we adapted God to fit the life that we wanted. Instead of letting God's word speak to us and adapt our lives to what God wanted. We are Laodicean church age. We're completely consumed with possessions, with the thoughts and the desires of the world. And God's saying, hey, your time's running out. Your time is running out. How do you want to stand before me in the terror of the Lord? Because you have an opportunity to do things differently. You can choose a different path. But listen, that's for us. But listen, there's also a final judgment for sin that is coming. And we saw it described earlier because Christ, listen, he's not going to judge us for our sins. That's not us. That took place on the cross. But what we're going to see here is for those that reject the cross, there is a judgment coming. Verse uh, number two says, refine their accountability. Verse 14, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord shall take come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households. And the households which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. When God judges the sins of mankind, it will not matter what country you come from. It will not matter what your family name was. It will not matter what your parents did. It will only matter what you did. God will hold us individually, personally accountable for the life we chose to live. Are you guys with me? Yeah. There's a lot of blank looks today. Hope I'm not like blowing past. I was thinking maybe my fly was down, but I, you would never know because I'm standing behind this. <laughs> Y'all are all like, oh. what I need you to understand because this is important this is important there is a judgment coming there is a judgment that is coming and there is nothing that's going to protect people there's going to be no excuse that we can use but God I didn't know no that's a load of garbage he said I gave you my word I preserved it through time and I left it on the planet you have access to it you can see it my goodness with the internet today it's everywhere you can get access to the Bible no problem we just choose not to hear it we have Bibles and we don't read them we have an opportunity to pray and we don't pray we have an opportunity to reach people. We're so concerned with ourselves and the cares of the world and what people will think we don't do it. Right. Amazingly, and God said, hey, wake up. I'm trying to warn you of what is coming. Romans 3, 23 and 24 says this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is the problem everybody has. We're all sinners. We're all failed. We're all broken. Verse 24, but being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We're redeemed through the Lord. Listen, salvation is not a birthright. It is a conscious choice that every individual must make. You call upon the name of the Lord by faith. Listen, if you've never chosen Christ as your Savior, then you're not saved. You can tell yourself that you are. You can stick your head in the sand and Pretend that tomorrow's not coming, that there's not a morning on the way, but there will be a judgment. If you're online and you're watching this and say, oh, I, I know I'm saved. Okay. 
because you're religious, because you go to church. Those are great things. But hey, it comes down to a personal relationship with Christ. Do I know I gave my heart to him? I'm not trying to get you unsaved today. That's not my, not my goal. But I know there are people that sit in church that believe they're saved and they're not. My daughter was one of those people. My daughter didn't get saved. She thought she got saved when she was about nine. And she sat in church for all those years. But there was this thing inside that just kept gnawing at her. And she was a soul winner. She's running people to Christ. She's doing all these things. She's serving, serving, serving. And she kept telling herself, because I'm doing these things, I must be saved. Because I'm doing these things, I've got to be a child of God. I read the Bible, I pray, but there was still this nagging thing inside going, but what if? What if? And at the age of 18 years old, she finally was like, holy moly, I'm lost. And it was a realization of recognizing her sin, understanding her accountability to the God of the universe, and knowing that time runs short. And you know what? God set her free. And the, the thing she struggled with for years was finally gone. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Set free. Understand the judgment. Revelations 20, verse 11 through 15. One more time. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. You know what that means is? It says there was found no place for them. Their home is not with God. Verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were cast, uh, 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 delivered up of the dead which were in them, every one, okay? And they were judged, every man, according to their works. Now, we all know the awful and regrettable things that we have done in this life, right? Things that maybe no one else knows. We did it in the deepest, darkest, most private moment. Our secret, hidden sin. If I can tell you, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, no matter how deeply you've hidden it, and how far deep down you have buried it, God is not only going to reveal it, but hold you accountable for it. Verse 14, Revelation 20, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Children of God, if you're born again, that means you've had two births. Jesus said in John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You had a physical birth and you have a spiritual birth, born twice. So as a believer, we're born twice and die once. But a lost person is born once, a physical birth, and they will die twice. Once physically and then spiritually. A spiritual death. That's why it says a second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, which brings us to divine, for God defining sin's penalty. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath. And you see, it's this awful reality, this horrible, horrible reality that needs to reach our hearts. There are lost people today who are on their way to hell, not because they're worse than us, but because they have denied Christ or they don't know him. And as people who know him, we need to tell them. We need to share with the importance of this. Because recognize there are people that know of him that are religious sitting in church, maybe here today. You know of Christ. You know of the Bible. You know of all the things you need to think you, you know of. But you do not hold him personally. I don't care if you pray a prayer. It's not a prayer. It's your heart. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There is a judgment coming. Now, we're not promised tomorrow. None of us. And all these people that we're worried about, neither are they. That's why we need to be about the Father's business. Revelation 20, 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know what that means? It says there, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, meaning that those who were found in the book were there. You're found in the book, hey, right on. You're in the book. You made it. 
So that means you and I will be witnesses of the great white throne judgment. As God judge sin, judges sin, we'll be there as observers. Think about that. Our friends, our neighbors, our family members that we did not share the gospel with, that God gave us opportunity to speak to, put us in their lives, they're going to look at us when God passes judgment of fire upon them. Can you imagine someone you sat beside at work for 20 years and they're lost as a goose in a snowstorm and you never cared for their soul? They're going to look at you and say, why didn't you care? An uncomfortable conversation, that's what you were worried about? This is my eternity. I'm going to burn forever. You had a chance to save me and you didn't even care enough to tell me a thing? Guys, I grew up around Christians my whole life. At 34 years old, no one shared the gospel with me. 34 years old, 34 years on this planet, I could have burned in hell until somebody finally cared enough to have an uncomfortable conversation. And I wasn't receptive. I wasn't like, man, I can't wait to talk about Jesus. Come on in my house. I was like, Jesus, oh boy, this is going to be a terrible conversation. Ugh. I don't know anything about the Bible. I don't even know if I believe in God. I don't know. But thank God they were willing to have the conversation. Right? right? That's what God's calling us to. We've got to have a heart for the lost. We've got to realize the fact that this is a reality. These people are going to suffer for all of an eternity. Why do you think God included this in the Bible in Revelations 21, 4? And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Because as that person is screaming their way to hell, and all those memories come flooding back to us of when we could have said or what we could have or should have done, or because our testimony was garbage and they looked at our life and they said, it's all a lie. We will be overwhelmed with suffering and sadness. It won't last forever, but that is coming for us. You notice he continues, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. But that's going to be a horrific day. Horrific day. And this is why God wants us to reinforce his policy. Verse 15. Because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. It's our job to tell this hurting broken and lost world that there is a God in heaven. They may not want to believe that, but they've got to tell them, we've got to tell them there's a God in heaven that's not only is he real, but he loves them. <laughs> he loves them in spite of them, in spite of what they say to him, in spite of what they curse his name, he still loves them. And you know what his desire is? To restore them back to their creator. He created them for a love relationship with him. He's done all the work. And he's asking us just to tell people what he's done. Share the truth in love. Not in judgment, not as a hammer. We don't pound people with the gospel. We whisper the loving words of Christ to be redeemed back to God. Because recognize, whether or not somebody wants to accept it as truth or not, all of humanity is going to end up answering to God. Will it be as the redeemed or as the reprobate? Depends on what we do with Christ. There's a great responsibility on us to be Christians, Christ-like. The Bible says see salt and light. You know what salt does? It changes things. You know what light does? It changes things. God's saying that your existence in this world should change it for the glory of God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And, Lord, I know today was, it was uh, perhaps a little hard. Um, but, God, I know you told me this is what we're supposed to hear. And, God, I'm just trying to faithfully follow. And, uh, Lord, I just pray that you help us today to, uh, to be receptive to the truth. 
the doctrinal truth of what's being taught, to understand historically what's taking place and understand devotionally how it is we are to turn around and take this truth and use it in our life today. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, those that are struggling right now. I pray, Father, that you'll help them. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, listen, if you're here today and you say, look, I'm, I'm dealing with something in my life. I'm dealing with, this, with issues. I want to be a better servant of Christ, but I'm struggling right now. I'm going through a valley. I'm going through a, a time of challenge. Embrace the Lord. Embrace the Lord. Submit to God. Let him get you through this. Strengthen you for what's to come because this life is not about us. I want to encourage you. Stand for Christ. Stand for Christ. And if you're here today and you say, look, I don't know where I stand. I might be that person that's religious. I, have, I believe in God, but I don't know that I have a relationship. I don't know that I have that personal walk with God. I have that feeling that Riley had, that little struggle in my heart. And today I want to make that right. If God's calling you and he's telling you, listen, you need to receive Christ as your Savior, you're not saved. Listen, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. But listen, I need to know if I need to pray for you. If you're here today and you say, look, I don't know where I stand with God. I'm not sure I'm saved. Lift your hand. I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to say a word to you. All I'm going to know is I need to be praying for your soul. That's you today. Say, look, I don't know where I stand. Amen. Amen. I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? I don't know that I've received Christ, but I, I know I need to. I want a relationship with Christ. One more chance. Anybody else? I'm not sure I'm saved, but I want to be. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray to receive Christ. He has gripped your heart. You're here today and you're saying, you know what, I, I know. I know I've got hidden sin. I know I've got things in my life. I know my relationship with God's not where it needs to be. Either you're going to make things right, or maybe you don't know Christ at all. I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray right now to receive Christ as your Savior. In our hearts and minds, I want you to repeat after me. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And I understand the accountability I have with you. I recognize the love you have for me and the penalty that you paid on my behalf. By faith, I'm asking you to save my soul, to pay the debt that I could never pay. Lord, by faith, I'm trusting you as my Lord. Thank you for working in my life. Thank you for calling me to be your child. I pray that you'll help me to live for you. I'll see you in heaven one day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Head still bowed, eyes still closed. Listen, you prayed that prayer today and you were sincere. Not messing around, this is real. And you know you prayed and you meant it with your heart. Lift your hand real quick. Just say, hey, you know what, that was me. I prayed today, I received Christ as my Savior. Amen, amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? I received Christ as my Savior. Praise God. Lord, thank you for what you've done in our hearts today. And I do pray, Father, that you help us to realize that we are all going to answer to you. Lord, help us, God. Help us to sanctify ourselves unto tomorrow. Lord, that as you work in our hearts today, Lord, help us to take seriously the calling that you placed upon our lives. That, Lord, we're not to live this life for our own glory, but for yours. Help our lives to make a difference in eternity through the way we live, the things we say, and the love we display to this hurting and broken world. As people right now all over our planet are struggling, they're feel fearful, they're angry, they're consumed with the cares of the world. I pray, Father, that you help Christians to shine as light in the darkness, to be the salt and light that you called us to be. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. I pray you'll bless and guide us, protect us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna take just a minute. Brother Eric's gonna come in just a moment. We're gonna have an opportunity just for us to kind of talk to God. He's really hammered us a little bit today. He certainly hammered me if he didn't hammer you. So let's take a minute. Let's just talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, and then uh, we'll close out the service.
right. Amen. Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, I just want to share something quick because the message, again, I think Pastor preached that for, for me and him. If nobody else, hopefully y'all were on board with it. Um, but And I said earlier where we were singing, I said most of us are uh, easy to accept Jesus is, is our Savior, but not so much as the Lord of our lives. And I'm going to share you a failure in my life. I mean, this morning I listened to that message early, and I'm out driving around. I'm at a gas station. You know, I fill my tank with gas to get in the car, start driving away, and this young man catches my eye sitting right in front of the gas, right in front of the entranceway. And, and I'm driving up, and I start turning, and I get out almost to the street, and he just, he was on my heart. And my six-year-old's in the back, and I don't remember saying anything. I don't remember saying a word. But in my heart, I was like, the Lord has led, he's laying, me, laying him on my heart. I don't know why, I don't, I have no clue, but I, I turned around and I pulled up, got out of the car, handed him the track, got back in the car, and I felt pretty good about myself. And my six-year-old goes, Daddy, why were you saying that you weren't going to give him a track? Why were you saying that you didn't, you, you just, you had too much to do and you, you couldn't? I was like, I don't remember saying any of that. I don't. And my six-year-old, and I'm saying, what if I didn't stop? What if I just got on the road and kept on down the street? Could you imagine the conversation sitting at home with her? But, Daddy, you were in the car. You said you weren't going to stop. Why didn't you stop, Dad? You have this traction in the car. Why didn't you do that? So I want to share that as, as what I felt like as a failure in my life to give God the glory as a success at allowing him to be the Lord. And it's never too late. You know, it was one second from being on the road and not being able to turn back. And Lord laid it on my heart to say, you need to turn around and give that young man a track. And I don't know if he'll ever read it, but I know that I did what God wanted me to do this morning. You know, so I will pray for me. I will pray for you. Well, everybody here needs it. There's no question. I, I more than anybody need that. So thank you all for sharing this time with us. Thank you for worshiping. I just pray that the message does not fall uh, on deaf ears. I pray that we all would be have ears to hear and a desire to serve him. So let's pray and let's go home. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for chance after chance after chance, Lord, uh, that we do fall short and that we do fail. But, Lord, you love us so much. You're cheering for us. You want us to have uh, abundant life uh, through you, through serving you. And, Lord, I just thank you for blessing us all and loving us so much. In Jesus' name, amen.